I'm Marty Stauffer. Springtime with birds singing and flowers blooming is beautiful everywhere. But here in the Rockies, it's nothing short of a celebration when spring arrives to put an end to the deep snows and bitter winds of winter, the time the Indians called Hunger Moon. When the snow finally melts, which might be as late as June or July in these high mountain meadows, the new growth practically bursts out of the ground. It's almost as if these plants know there will only be a few brief months of summer before the hunger moon comes again. Those animals that survive from season to season must be well adapted to their mountain home. Over thousands of seasons, mountain creatures have developed many unique ways of coping with the harsh climate and rugged, unpredictable terrain. Truly the kings of survival. These are mountain monarchs. To live in these rugged and ever-changing heights, alpine animals have adapted their shapes and colors their size and form. Some have skid-proof hooves for climbing on rocks. Others have broadened feet for walking on snow. Many have colors and patterns that blend into their surroundings. The bobcat, for example. It's found nearly everywhere in the country. But the bobcat of the northern mountains is larger. Its fur is thicker and to match the pine forests, darker. Like all wild cats, a master of stealth. The object, in this case, is a small rabbit-like pika living in the talus rock slides near Timberline in Colorado. At the top of the food chain, the bobcat must hunt small animals like rabbits, birds, and rodents. The self-confident pika lets the bobcat get less than a foot away before darting into its burrow. But such overconfidence is not always warranted. The bobcat is determined and lightning fast. This wildcat has an interesting behavior. It plays with its catch. This play may be a survival adaptation, which allows a predator to sharpen its hunting skills. Whatever the reason, it looks to me as if the bobcat is enjoying it, playing almost lovingly with its dead prey. Another pika watches, dangerously close. Although the bobcat plays with the pika, it kills for a very serious reason. 
to survive. The eaglets are brought food by both parents until they are old enough to leave the nest and hunt on their own. And they do their part by helping to keep the nest clean. Golden eagles prefer a nest overlooking a meadow so that they can spot prey, such as this colony of marmots, greeting each other after their long winter hibernation. Their future predators change dramatically over the next several weeks. Growing stronger every day on the high protein diet provided by their parents. Eventually looking more like the magnificent predatory birds they are destined to become. The broad white tail band called ringtail plumage, marks them as immature, but not too young to discover their wings at the age of about two months. First, they'll try catching an updraft from a ledge below the nest. Then they may even try to generate their own wind. For now, the marmots can watch in amusement. Learning to fly always involves a few crash landings. But in another month, the young eagles will be flying and hunting in earnest. What was work becomes play as they joyfully soar and glide for hours. Unlike these ground-dwelling marmots, the eagles are not hindered by rough, impassable terrain. With their ability to soar long distances over high peaks, the birds are truly the masters of alpine living. Diving for prey, the golden eagle can attain speeds up to 150 miles per hour. The doll sheep is found in Alaska and Canada, where their high mountain home is covered with snow at least nine months a year. A snow patch makes an excellent playing field as they romp and run, carefree yet confident on non-skid shock-absorbing hooves. These sheep are white, all year round. 
Like all wild sheep, the doll have horns. The older males are massive and curled. To the south, in the gray slate mountains of the southern Yukon and northern British Columbia, lives a subspecies of the doll sheep, the stone sheep, colored a light gray that matches their habitat. They're now in shorter, thinner coats for summer, but all year round, their coats are made up of hollow, insulating hair, not wool like domestic sheep. But like all sheep, they eat tender grasses, shoots, and buds. Here, they are literally eating dirt. It contains a high degree of salt and other minerals. To get to their favorite salt lick, the stone sheep may travel for miles. These Rocky Mountain bighorn, found in the mountains of the western states, are also fond of salt. And they overcame their normal shyness to lick my hand for a taste of it. Not white to match the snow, or gray to match the shale. The hair of these bighorn is brown. The mountain lion, or cougar, is usually nearby, waiting for a chance to ambush a weak or an unwary animal. But with its strong legs and hooves, and its knowledge of trails and escape routes, even a surprised bighorn can give a mountain lion a good run for its meal. Some people think of them as enemies. But as odd as it may sound, when I see something like this, it looks to me as if the predator has a very loving and tender relationship with its prey. In the fall of the year, the male and female bands unite for the rutting season. This is the time when the equally matched prime rams, about six to eight years old, test each other to determine which ones will do the breeding. The rams square off. With weights up to 300 pounds and powerful hindquarters that enable them to move fast and hit hard, they size each other up, then slam together with their huge horns. Even though two rams may settle an account with these battles, they must compete again for a ewe and estrus, the condition in which the female is ready to breed, but apparently not always that willing. 
Both rams are attracted and excited by her odor, but the ewe doesn't want anything to do with them. reluctance seems to be another kind of natural selection at work. Because she is so difficult to catch, only the strongest, fastest ram is finally able to breed her, and so continue the line of the strongest, fastest bighorn. She may be bred several times. Next spring, she will find a secluded ledge and give birth. With their heavy, chunky bodies, the Rocky Mountain Bighorn are the largest wild sheep in North America. In the southwestern mountains and down into Mexico live the smallest, thinnest wild sheep, the desert bighorn. This fourth, and final, wild sheep is a light buff color, which reflects the desert's heat and sun. The desert is unforgiving. Sheep die, and their bones are picked clean by scavengers. To get precious water, this ram is budding a yucca plant, breaking it open and chewing its moisture-laden pulp. Although the desert bighorn know the location of every water source in their area, in the dry season, they must often go days without drinking. When the rains finally come to this arid land, they're a welcome relief for the desert creatures. A time, however brief, when they can relax and forget the pressures of daily survival. So now we've seen the four kinds of wild sheep, truly mountain monarchs. From south to north, the desert bighorn, the Rocky Mountain bighorn, the stone, and the doll sheep. Back in the northern Rockies in Canada lives the Rocky Mountain goat. It prefers even steeper, more remote areas than the sheep. These relatively tame goats in a national park were around me for months before they got even this close. Mountain goats don't adapt well to man and prefer to stay as far away from him as possible, up on the highest lookouts. Their double coats, shaggy on the outside, soft and woolly underneath, protect them from the wind and weather on these peaks. With cushioned, skid-proof pads on their hooves, the goats can scale cliffs that even the confident wild sheep wouldn't attempt. They can live on far more meager rations also, lichens and moss, for example.
the golden aspens and gentle breezes of fall eventually give way to the ice-covered evergreens and howling winds of winter. The water oozel, or dipper, must brave the frigid stream to dive for its food. Underneath the ice, a miraculous transformation is taking place at a time when all other creatures are doing their utmost to endure the winter the brook trout is perpetuating itself from december to march they spawn in these cold oxygen rich waters the female on the left clears some gravel to prepare for egg laying she may lay up to ten thousand eggs fertilized by the sperm from only one male. The fertilized eggs lodge in the gravel. Over the next several months, the eggs develop. And in early spring, the young finally hatch. With large nourishing yolks to feed on, the sack fry remain in the gravel beds. A two-headed larva will probably never reach adulthood, but there are many others to take its place. For the brook trout, survival depends on excessive overproduction. Yolk sacs gone, these fingerlings now move about to find their own food, small creatures like caddisflies. They won't begin to eat other fishes until a year or two from now, when they are full grown like this adult. Above the water, winter continues. The pika is prepared. It has laid in a store of dried grass. The bighorn now must be content to eat any plant they can find. The grizzly bear sleeps, snug and warm, with the insulating fat layer it put on last fall. The rosy finch nibbles at dried seeds. And the mountain lion roams the foothills, looking for food and water. The ptarmigan has ingenious adaptations that help it through the season. It can survive on limited food, as it is here, eating willow buds. Its color changes to white and allows it to blend in with the snow and to escape detection by a predator. For better footing on the unpacked snow, the ptarmigan grows long feathers on its toes. With these winter adaptations, it's little wonder that these beautiful snowbirds look so calm. Sharing some of their adaptations, is the snowshoe hare, turning white in winter, and as its name implies, having large snowshoe feet. Man also uses this modification to distribute his weight evenly and walk more easily on uncrusted snow. If it is detected by a predator, escape is easy. Winter rations for the snowshoe are pine needles, unlike rabbits and hares elsewhere, which prefer more tender and succulent food. 
the snowshoe can easily live on this Spartan diet. Like the ptarmigan and the hare, the weasel also changes color. But with winter finally coming to an end, a white coat isn't much help, especially with a red-tailed hawk overhead. Both animals are predators, but a hawk will catch a weasel when it can. Springtime, with all its promises, arrives once again. The snowshoe hare reverts to its brown summer coat, and all the alpine animals continue to live, adapt, and survive, as they have for countless seasons. I'm always amazed that these creatures can prosper in such a harsh environment and I can only hope that their future will be as successful as their past. All mountains, even though they may look rugged and unchanging, have fragile, easily disturbed ecosystems. Man's mining, building, lumbering, and livestock grazing have much greater impact up here than they do in the lowlands. We cannot develop all of our mountain wilderness areas with no regard for wildlife. For many creatures, this is their only home and their last refuge. We must set aside sanctuaries where they can live and rule the heights as mountain monarchs. I'm Marty Stauffer. Until next time, enjoy our wild America.